I want to welcome you all, students, staff, faculty, prospective students, and our friends from the community, to the 28th Annual Antoinette Brown Lecture. It is truly remarkable that for as long as I have been alive, students from this Divinity School have gathered to select a lecturer, arrange all the details of her visit, chop carrots for the reception, send out invitations, arrange for babysitters, arrange flowers, and plan the ABL worship service. This lecture, established by a gift from Sylvia Sanders Kelly, is remarkable in many ways. But perhaps it is most striking because it consistently reflects the commitment of the students at Vanderbilt Divinity School to celebrate the role of women in ministry and theological education. The namesake of this lecture, Antoinette Brown, born in 1825, was the first woman in the United States to be ordained in Christian ministry. She once wrote, Women are needed in the pulpit as imperatively and for the same reason women are needed in the world, because they are women. Women have become, or when the ingrained habit of unconscious imitation has been superseded, they will become indispensable to the religious evolution of the human race. For Holly Woodruff and me, the experience of co-coordinating this event has been truly humbling. There is simply no way that all of the pieces would have come together so beautifully if we had been on our own. I'd like to thank all of the men and women who have worked so hard to keep this fantastic tradition alive. Also, thank you to the sponsors, they're listed in your program, for your support. Finally, thank all of you for being here and for celebrating women and the increasingly indispensable role that women play in religious evolution of the human race. I would like to invite you to continue this celebration after the lecture tonight in Tillett Lounge, directly behind Benton Chapel, uh, for a reception. Thank you very much. Good evening, I'm James Hudnoff Wormler, Dean of Vanderbilt Divinity School, and it is my pleasure to uh, begin by thanking the students, and particularly Amy and Holly, for continuing the tradition and finding a wonderful speaker for this evening. It's my uh, pleasure as well to get to introduce Susan Brooks Thistleite. It is fitting that tonight's lecture honors the memory of Antoinette Brown, a woman of courage and faith from the congregational wing, originally from the congregational wing of this school's heritage. For we are pleased to welcome tonight a woman of courage and faith from our own generation who also does theology out of the context of the United Church of Christ. Susan Brooks Thistlethwaite is the 11th president of Chicago Theological Seminary, where she has served as a professor of theology since 1981. A minister in the United Church of Christ, she's a graduate of Duke University's Graduate School of Religion and its Divinity School and of Smith College. Dr. Thistlethwaite's work as a theologian has ranged widely from ecclesiology to global justice, from inclusive language in worship to inclusive practices in Christian feminism across the lines of race. Among her 10 books are these titles which illustrate this range. Lift Every Voice, Constructing Christian Theologies from the Underside, which has reappeared in a 10th anniversary edition from Orbis Press. Casting Stones, Prostitution and Liberation in Asia and the United States, which she wrote with Rita Nakashima Brock. The New Testament and Psalms, an inclusive version uh, from Oxford University Press. In all of this work, Dr. Thistlethwaite has pursued justice in society and in the Christian churches. 
As you can see from this evening's title, she is not afraid to weigh in with theological reflection and perhaps caution at a time of emergent opportunity and danger. She is perhaps prepared in another way as well for the topic of tonight's address, Adam and Eve and the Genome. For like Eve and Adam, Dr. Thistlethwaite and her physician husband, J.R. Thistlethwaite, have sons, in their case, three sons. Dr. Thistlethwaite, welcome. We await your remarks. The evening has already demonstrated women's competence because we got the PowerPoint to work. Okay. <laughs> so, um, thank you for the generous introduction and thank you for inviting me this evening. Thistlethwaite is difficult and uh, it was heroic, really, your efforts <laughs> to keep saying it. I had the funniest thing happen to me uh, with my annual physical. I uh, came in and there was a new receptionist and she looked up at me and she looked down at the piece of paper and just perfectly she says, Thistlethwaite? And I was just about to say, how well you pronounce that? And she says, Thuthan? <laughs> <laughs> and take Thith and go in there. So it's simply that you speak normally, uh, that you are able to, um, to uh, have trouble with my name. Adam, Eve, and the genome is true. We're just going to weigh right in here. Um, and slide two, please. Um, I began reading about the Human Genome Project uh, in order to talk to my second son, Bill. Uh, my oldest son, James, is a physicist. He does research in laser technology. James is, in any case, a deist. And so there's almost no point in trying to, to talk to James. If there had been email in high school, I would have emailed him in his room. Um, so I talked to his girlfriend, soon to be wife. Um, but my second son, Bill, is a deeply religious child, as well as, at the time, being a neuroscience major at Amherst. And he was reading and studying about genetics, and he was telling me about his questions. So I picked up uh, Ma uh, the Ridley book, Matthew Ridley's book, The Genome, the Autobiography of a Species in 23 Chapters. And I began to read it. And this culminated this fall in Laurel Schneider and I having applied jointly for a grant together last spring uh, to the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences, and we taught the course, Adam, uh, Eve, and the Genome, uh, jointly, and we used this um, picture to advertise the course because the grant was a little late in coming, so we had to go drum up business in the other seminary, so we used this as the poster. And um, we were able, uh, through the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences, to hire a geneticist from the University of Chicago, and through her efforts, it was jointly taught in the Division of Biological Sciences of the University of Chicago and also Chicago Theological Seminary. And I will say more about our geneticist uh, later. Third slide. No, just, just that. There you go. Right. And the fourth slide. That's me. Okay, the Human Genome Project. Now, Matthew Ridley, this is a good book. Any, I'd like to see, have anybody read the Ridley book? Okay, a couple of people. Um, he is a good communicator. He has a gift for image. And he uses it very effectively in this book on the autobiography of a species to communicate to, I think it's a non-technical book, it's a lay audience, um, and one of his er metaphors is that the genome is a book. And he says, and this is a quotation from the book, there are 23 chapters called chromosomes. Each chapter contains several thousand stories called genes. Next slide. Each story is made up of paragraphs called exons. 
which are interrupted by advertisements called introns, and we're not going to do what's called junk DNA tonight. We have enough trouble with regular DNA. Next slide. Each paragraph is made up of words called codons. Each word is written in letters called bases. Next slide. Now, this book, says Ridley, is longer than 800 Bibles. 800 Bibles. As I thought about it, metaphor is not entirely the right word to describe what Ridley is talking about when he says that the genome is a book. Because it's more like a literal description. You have some insight other than plugging into your email and your word processing into how your computer processes information. You know that digitized information is 0, 1, 1, 0, and the pattern of repetition of that conveys the code. That's the digital code. Genetic information is written in four letters, A, C, G, T, which stand for adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. Now, when we say, therefore, that the genome is a word, we mean literally that it is made of these letters, the top line, the DNA strand is made of these letters, which stand for those chemicals. The letters make words, and they are words always of three letters, and the words make sentences. So I'm reading along in Ridley, and on page 12 it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word proselytized the sea with its message, copying itself unceasingly and forever. The Word discovered how to rearrange chemicals so as to capture little eddies in the stream of entropy and make them live. The word transformed the land surface of the planet from a dusty hell to a verdant paradise. The word eventually blossomed and became sufficiently ingenious to build a porridge contraption called a human brain that to discover and be aware of the word itself. Now, you don't have to be a PhD in theology to be hit over the head with the fact that we are literally a word from the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And what struck me only on page 12 of the Ridley book is that sentence is literally true. That sentence is literally true. Life is a word. Now, what kind of theologian would I be if I couldn't make something of that? So I'm digesting this in my office, and Laurel Schneider comes in and says that she wants to apply for a grant to the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences. And Laurel, too, had been reading genetics. She had actually taught uh, genetics, uh, well, at least religion and science, in her previous job. We taught it this past fall with Dr. Laney Ross of the University of Chicago Medical Center. Interestingly, Laney is an Ashkenazi Jew and a deeply religious person, also having a PhD in philosophy from Yale in addition to being an MD. Unexpectedly, but as is rather typical at Chicago Theological Seminary, we ended up teaching a Jewish Christian religion science course. And uh, more relevance about Laney's uh, um, Jewish insights and also her being an Ashkenazi Jew, I will mention later in the lecture. Next slide. This page and the last one I clipped out of the student project, which was the requirement for the course. We had about seven students from the Division of Biological Sciences and about uh, 14 divinity school students, seminary students from CTS. And they had one assignment. And this assignment was to take what they had learned in this course on both religion and science 
and turn it into a web course for lay people and clergy. And this web course will be up on the seminary's website this spring, and you may click on www.ctschicago.edu and find this course. I think they did a beautiful job because I think the images are particularly vivid. One thing that became quickly apparent to Laurel and me as we fleshed out the design this last summer is we were not going to be able to cover all of the theological loci and we needed to narrow our focus for some kind of meaty, any kind of, of meaty theological science discussion. So we chose to focus, hence the title, on theological anthropology. Now, even within theological anthropology, for the purposes of this lecture, I'm going to narrow that even further to the constructive posture of feminist liberation theology. And simply for the purposes of this lecture, and because it's a handy description, I'm going to define feminism as a critique of culture in light of patriarchy, a common definition. Now, as one begins to travel in the religion science dialogue circles, and I had not before, my previous forays into religion and science had been due to being married to a transplant surgeon for 33 years. And from time to time, uh, my husband has asked me to uh, help him in different problems that emerge in transplant, some of these being largely pastoral. If God wanted me to have a new kidney, God would have given me a new kidney. Uh, some of them theological. If I rise, will my parts rise with me or will they rise with the person to whom I donated them or vice versa? Um, these are serious, serious questions, serious questions, talking about the relationship of self and other, the relationship of, uh, of us to how we understand ourselves to be embodied human beings, uh, and some on uh, more difficult ethical questions like living-related liver transplant, for example, and I did a paper with Dick on that. But I had not traveled in the religion science um, community and it was interesting to me as Laurel and I began to do this work to see that there are two theological perspectives that are largely represented. One being process theology. This is a natural um, bridge between theology and the sciences and uh, you find a lot of people who do process theology uh, are in these dialogues. The other one uh, uh, being very often uh, reformed theology, evangelical theology, and certainly Catholic uh, natural theologians are represented there. Uh, needless to say, perhaps you would be aware, Laurel and I, the only feminist theologians in most of these dialogues, and certainly for me, the only feminist liberation theologian. Liberation theologies have been particularly, conspicuously absent from dialogues between religion and science. Now this has multiple causes. I think one important one being the emphasis in liberation theologies on the human being as agent in history. The origin of the theologies of liberation are in looking at history, when I titled Lift Every Voice, theologies from the underside, Liberation theologies tend to look at theology from the underside of history and to take history as primary for understanding the work of God with the world. Science, particularly the new genetics, needs the insights of liberation theology, particularly the epistemology of the oppressed. That is, trying to stand with those who are on the underside of history and trying to think through with them the impact of uh, uh, whatever is happening in the political life, the economy, or in this case, science. Uh, but it is also true, liberation theologians have been quite silent uh, on the subject of science. 
But these insights in the methods of gene therapy, even the mapping of the genome itself, stand to disproportionately impact vulnerable populations. It is not surprising that it is Tuskegee University that published the papers of a conference on the impact of the Human Genome Project on the African American community. Does that surprise you, given the syphilis experiments? Probably not. The exchange between liberation theology and science is not all one-sided. That is, that liberation theology offers a critique of science. I think that liberation theologies benefit from the contact with the implications of the new genetics as it becomes aware of perhaps a bias in the emphasis on the human being as agent in history. The rest of creation for some theologies of liberation risks being relegated to an object of human endeavor, not a subject in its own right. If you learn nothing else from this lecture tonight, learn this. The impact of this research is to definitively demonstrate all creation is one. Ridley writes, the three letter words of the genetic code are the same in every creature. CGA means arginine and GCG means alanine in bats, in beetles, in beech trees, and in bacteria. Wherever you go in the world, whatever animal, plant, bug, or blob you look at, if it is alive, it will use this dictionary and it'll be written in this code. All life is one. All life is one. Feminist, Native American, and to some extent Asian and indigenizing African theologies and liberation theologies have not tended to be quite as anthropocentric in their work. They work from a commitment to the oneness of creation and tend not to retreat from the natural world, as did the liberal theologies before them. However, there are also some feminist theologies that have retreated from the historical political world. Dialogue with the new genetics does not only mean raising hymns to our common genetic ancestry and standing in awe of the fact that we and celery have about 70% of our genetic material in common. I know this explains a lot about certain people. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. We are one. But I want to alert you to the fact that there are political and social implications if you do not own the copyright to your own genetic material. Do you own your genome? And if you don't, who does? May I simply say the word insurance to make this point. Don't you think the insurance companies would like to have your genetic code? If you carry BRCA1 on chromosome 17 or BRCA2 on chromosome 13, the notorious breast cancer genes, and this information is not protected, what are your chances of being uninsurable, of being unemployable, even if you never develop breast cancer? These are very real questions. I am going to bring up three points in terms of theological anthropology that I think are provoked by the Human Genome Project. And I'm going to deal with each in turn from the perspective of the theologies of liberation, and particularly feminist liberation theologies. The first is this first point that I have made, species solidarity. Species solidarity. One of the inescapable learnings from the Human Genome Project is that human beings are deeply creatures 
in the most basic sense. We share 90% of our genes with mice. 90%. We share 98.4% of our genes with chimpanzees. Chimpanzees share 97% of their genes with gorillas. That means that chimpanzees have more in common with humans than they do with gorillas, genetically speaking. Human beings have 30,000 genes. Wild asparagus has 25,000. How far away from wild asparagus or a celery are we? Not all that far. Too often, theological anthropology has mistaken the image of God for an unbridgeable gulf between human beings and the rest of creation. Coupled with a body-spirit dualism, which definitively Rosemary Ruther has shown as the linchpin of patriarchalism, this has placed man, and I am in no way being generic, at the top of a pyramid, with women and children and those deemed of lesser races below. The image of God has been held to reside primarily in reason, especially a concept of reason as disinterested objectivity. Now, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, I am sure, about feminist theology. Some of the most deeply held tenets of feminist theology are supported by the Human Genome Project and its research. This would be first and foremost the connectedness to nature that is amply documented by the remarkable similarity across the creation of how genetic material functions. Certainly for feminist theology, the fundamental conviction of unity with the rest of creation derives in part from this definition I offered earlier of the critique of, of, the critique of culture in light of patriarchy. It was certainly Susan Griffin's book, Women in Nature, that first extensively documented the symbolic identification, women and nature, and the denigration of both women and nature as on a continuum of body-spirit dualism. Griffin also attempts to relate this connectedness to nature and the critique of the framework of dominance in a socio-political setting. In her later book, Pornography and Silence, Griffin writes, quote, we are inseparable from all other beings in the universe. In a more passionate, and is always the case for her, inflated rhetoric, Mary Daly makes the same point in her book, Pure Lust. Thousands of women struggle to remember ourselves and our history to sustain and intensify a biophilic consciousness. Now, liberation theology would say this is accessible to all. Carol Christ, Margaret Atwood, Starhawk, Sally McFaig, the women of Greenham Common, and a whole host of other feminist theologians and activists have all poignantly tried to raise the theological point, human beings are connected to nature at the most profound level. The political activists, such as Starhawk or, Greenham, or the Greenham Common Women in particular, have made the political connection to militarism and environmental degradation that is sometimes missing in other feminist analyses, Carol Chris being a case in point, in the relationship of women and nature. I read today in the Chicago Tribune that in their infinite wisdom, the nuclear planners convened in the Bush administration are seriously considering small tactical nuclear weapons development called, you could believe it, precision nukes. This is environmental contempt as well as the contempt for the human being at its most basic level. Militarism is deeply complicit with environmental degradation. 
Womanist theologians have lifted their voice as a cogent liberation critique on the theological justification of those who are symbolically the creature, therefore, of course, non-dominant races. The curse of these exploited who hope that the dominance will be the first to stew in the chemicals they marinate the planet in. When we turn later in a lecture to an examination of genetic engineering and gene therapy from the perspective of those most historically vulnerable to scientific exploitation, the theological emphasis on the unity of human beings with nature needs to be lifted up again. The manipulation of genetic material will reinvent the dominance of nature, just in another form. It is the resurrection of the pyramid model of human beings over nature. Species unity, what we have in common with other creatures, point two. Unity, what human beings have in common with each other. The early work of feminist psychologists such as Carol Gilligan, Jean Baker Miller, Nancy Chodoro, has grounded feminist theory in relationality and connection, one human being to another. Another profound learning from the Human Genome Project is that at the genetic level, racial distinctions are so minor as to be almost negligible. Humanity is profoundly related one to another. Genetically speaking, we are deeply connected. We are more than 99.9% .9 the same. One of the things we did in class this fall is a laboratory on DNA fingerprinting. We used a polymerase chain reaction to pick out a repeating DNA sequence. And so, let me just go to the board for a minute. So we chopped out a little piece of the genome. We did this by using a gel, a previously prepared gel they just purchased. You spit into a test tube, put some chemical in there, you spin it around in a centrifuge, and then you take that glop and you mail it off to the lab and they run it through a gel. Now this is non-protein coding DNA that this selects for, so we were not about to find suddenly that we carried some hideous uh, um, disease, but this is the way that you would do genetic fingerprinting uh, for uh, um, in a criminal case. Now we get then a map, looked like, it was a Xerox and I was going to make a slide of it, but it just didn't turn out very well. And you get your section, just this little boxcar, you know, the, if you can imagine this is a train and there are boxcars, one connected to another, just that little boxcar, length of it showing both alleles, one from the mother, one from the father. Now, heterozygous means it doesn't line up. You get different uh, uh, genes, one from your mother, one from your father. I am, given my polyglot ancestry, I was heterozygous. I didn't, didn't match. Laney Ross, the Ashkenazi Jew, was homozygous. Her, the genetic material she inherited from her father, the genetic material she inherited from her mother, we're the same. We're the same. We have another friend, um, a, um, also a member of the same community, donated a kidney to a member of his family. Five antigen match. Practically an identical twin. Very consistent genetic heritage. Okay, we had this picture of our gel-separated genes, and then alongside, they gave us a section from other populations, Asian, African, Latin American, European. Now, in this short DNA sequence, I had the most in common with the Asian. 
I think the reason for this is that I am most immediately the child of Hungarian immigrants, but these were Mongols who emigrated across Asia from Russia. So I am, genetically speaking, more like an Asian than an Anglo-Saxon. I have actually no Anglo-Saxon ancestors, but I look Anglo-Saxon, don't I? <laughs> From a liberation perspective, one of the things this genetic unity of humanity means, and we had invited other theologians, biblical scholars, and so forth from the CTS faculty to guest lecture. And Dr. Ched Jennings, another theologian at CTS, gave a very fine guest lecture. And he said this, at the immediate practical level, race is a category invented by early modern Europeans and a complete fiction, a fabrication of the will to domination. One of the most interesting and alarming and instruction, instructive inventions of modernity and modern science has been white supremacy. From a theological perspective, this has always been an unspeakable heresy that makes utter nonsense of the most basic affirmations of the Christian faith. From a genetic perspective, it is also fiction. It's fiction. The Human Genome Diversity Project, here's the tricky slide part. Okay, you're gonna go forward several slides. One, two, three, four. There, we have slides out of order. I changed the lecture this afternoon in the hotel room, but I wanna talk about the Human Genome Diversity Project now. There is not one single genome repeated again and again in every individual. You, each of you, I, am completely unique unless you have a twin. What the Human Genome Project has done is to average about 200 anonymous individuals in forming its version of the human genome. These individuals are drawn from employees of the National Institutes of Health. This project perhaps could better be named the Western European Human Genome. To provide information of human genetic variation through the globe, the Human Genome Diversity Project has been seeking since 1993 to collect genetic material from 400 to 500 geographically isolated or culturally unique populations. The Human Genome Diversity Project has been plagued from the beginning with a host of concerns about racial exploitation and the difficulties of obtaining genuine consent from the populations to be studied. There is fear on the part of some that the Human Genome Diversity Project could be a vehicle, and here's some new words perhaps for you, for biopiracy or biocolonialism. Biopiracy, a traffic, we would hope an illegal traffic in genetic material. Biocolonialism, we take people's land and then we take their products and now we're going to take their genetic material. But if there is a population whose genome does contain, let us speculate, an arrangement of genes that prevents anyone in that tribe from getting cancer, and someone from the scientific community discovers it, do you think they'll get the royalties? Biocolonialism. Now the Chinese Human Genome Diversity Project has actually, is the one that is furthest along seemingly less troubled by consent. It has been collecting cell lines from its official ethnic groups and has begun a preliminary analysis of its data. The Chinese Human Genome Diversity Project shows distinct genetic differences between northern and southern Chinese ethnicities. In addition, the study has reached the conclusion that the majority of the gene pool in East Asia 
originates from Africa. So while it is the case that from a feminist perspective, connectedness of the human community means we are profoundly one, the social constructions of racism endure, and they structure even scientific research into the human genome itself. The emphasis of the theologies of liberation on the social construction of sin are very relevant at this point. We do not approach scientific investigation with a theological tabula rasa. The accumulated individual sins that co-conspire to form larger structures of enduring evils, such as racism, sexism, colonialism, impact us all. No one is free, lives outside these structures. Each of us do. Theologians do, scientists do. And it is not possible to imagine yourself outside them. These must be taken into account as we evaluate the potential for any endeavor to work towards human betterment or human subjugation. This is a powerful thing that is happening in our midst. It has a potential for great good. It has a potential for great evil. I remember a number of years ago when my husband, because I have been a peace activist all my life, and my husband remarked to me as I was trotting off to yet another anniversary celebration, or celebration, morning, at the site of the first nuclear chain reaction under Regenstein Library on the campus of the University of Chicago, you know, actually probably by now more human lives have been saved from cancer through radiation treatments than were lost at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Even difficult and as environmentally degrading as it is, I think you could also include power from atomic energy. But just, let's just take radiation treatment. I was struck by the fact that I simply regard the splitting of the atom as an incredible heresy. And yet, my husband looks on it as treatment. Nothing is neutral. This is, again, as powerful, as powerful a scientific breakthrough, I think, is the splitting of the atom. Unity with other creatures, unity with one another, number three, how each human being is unique. You can start going backwards, try to get to the Ashkenazi Jews. Going backwards is a little more difficult because I forgot to bring the mouse, so. Uh, so you have to do it on the screen. Um, all right, third, how each human being is unique. Our individual distinctiveness today, from the perspective of DNA, is measured in terms of criminality. Most common use so far in the larger culture is the DNA fingerprint. It has certainly freed many people from prison, often from death row, or convicted others, when DNA evidence has been able to be obtained. This is, in fact, the lab we ran. We took our DNA fingerprint. As we novices were finishing up 25 or so of these relatively simple labs, one of the students said, if this is so easy to do, why does it take up to six years for people in prison to get their DNA fingerprint results? Why do you think? I think prosecutors are real interested in freeing more people from prison because they were wrongly convicted. This is not a complicated lab. It's an easy thing to do. We, theologians, could do it relatively quickly. <laughs> Maybe we just should start, you know, as a kind of subversive science thing. <laughs> we need to be concerned, taking the view from below in a liberation perspective, 
that our current, and you should pardon the expression, Justice Department will succeed and have every person accused of a crime, not even convicted of a crime. The current proposal is if you are accused of a crime, your DNA will be collected, tested, and kept on file. This suggests a future state where everyone is DNA fingerprinted at birth and the government has the files. But let's just suppose that human uniqueness is not limited to our potential for crime. How are we to understand it theologically? Feminist liberation theologians have approached the issue of the uniqueness of the human being in several ways. In contrast to theologians such as Reinhold Niebuhr, who held that the sin of pride, the selfishness of hubris, is the besetting sin of humanity, Valerie Saving, and after her Judith Plaskow, have held that sin for women, and again this is a generalization, is sometimes better described as failure to be a self. A temptation for some women is to dissolve the uniqueness of their individuality and become soluble to the needs and desires of others. The temptation to fail to be an individual is facilitated by the separation of the public arena, the arena of justice, and the home, the private sphere, stereotypically the realm of women, which is only the realm of love. Love and justice need to apply to both realms. Freedom and equality also apply to the private sphere and not just to the public. The soluble self is not always a preoccupation of all women. It varies around the world. But many women from different social and cultural racial locations have owned it as a concern. What remains constant from feminist theological perspectives on the nature of the self and individuality is always the social construction of power. We have to think about the social construction of power even when we think, maybe especially when we think about the self. Now where the genetic and the feminist theological are one and support one another is on the unique and fundamental irreplaceability of any one of us. This is why murder is such a heinous crime. That unique human being will not exist anymore. Ted Jennings, who teaches historical theology, actually reminded us that the cult of the veneration of saints, where you would have a little forefinger of a piece of the finger of a saint in a reliquy, was perhaps right on target. Because if you had that, you potentially had the whole person's DNA. Even cloning will not be able to achieve duplication as we are uniquely the product of the interactions of our genetic heritage with our changing environment. You cannot duplicate each individual's unique social history. Thus the unique value of each individual is asserted by the Human Genome Project not only spiritually but physically. Liberation theology written by women has this strong theme as well. Bodies matter. The word was made flesh for a reason. Now, the uniqueness of each individual and the uniqueness of each community came forth very clearly in this course in relationship to the Ashkenazi Jewish community. These are European Jews who have had a very tight culture and they have intermarried. Lainey's homozygous. That means that she gets the same or very, very similar genetic inheritance from both parents. They are a target for genetic testing. Such homozygous communities show very clear lines of the inheritance of certain genetically carried disease. 
and the Ashkenazi Jews do have certain diseases that affect their community in very high numbers, Tay-Sachs, certain types of breast cancer, for example. Now, some of the problems with genetic testing are illuminated by this. Some members of the community very much want this testing so that they can, in fact, receive information that may make a difference to their health. But of course, genetic testing is much farther along than genetic intervention for the treatment of disease. Others in the community are very conflicted about this because they do fear, and their fears are, have not proven unfounded, that when it is known that their community carries these diseases at these very high rates, that they will be discriminated against in employment and by insurance companies. There are ethical issues to consider. Laney told a story of a disease. She has been genetically tested, and she has a disease that she self-examined about whether she should tell brothers and sisters, on the one hand, who already have children, there is no treatment for this disease. On the other hand, by disclosing this, it will enable them to inform their children for childbearing. Private, not private. What belongs to me as an individual? And what do others have the right to know about my particular genetic inheritance? I can imagine in many offices of pastors in the next decade, people will ask you this. In an article entitled 10 Million Women Missing Worldwide that appeared in the Chicago Tribune, a concern was raised that a number of female births has dropped precipitously in certain countries. Particularly where there is a one-child policy, amniocentesis is sometimes done to determine the sex of the child and female children are aborted. We are not that far from a genetically engineered future where it will be possible to change the child of the sex in vitro. Certain societies could then see the elimination of female births. The discovery, next slide, of XQ28 in 1993, the so-called gay gene, was at first greeted with celebration by GLBT persons and their friends. You may have seen the t-shirt that was sold in gay and lesbian bookstores in the mid-90s. XQ28, thanks for the genes, Mom. Molecular biologist Dean Hammer and his team at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda took blood and tested 40 pairs of homosexual brothers to see if they shared trait. Hammer had a suspicion that it would be on the X chromosome, and they looked for and found a specific segment of the X chromosome. 83% commonality of XQ28 led to this first assertion of a gay gene. What is the theological status of this finding? Is it that homosexuality is part of the unique biological heritage of some individuals and therefore has all the moral complexity of having brown eyes? Or, as Ted Peters labels it in his book, Playing God, is this a gay gene defect? Dean Hammer has said, quote, I think that discriminating against people based on their genetic makeup is wrong. The wrong genes should, quote, these are in quotes, quote, the wrong genes should never be used as a basis for terminating a pregnancy. Hammer opposes the idea of developing prenatal tests for homosexual orientation. If he eventually isolates the gene, he plans to patent this knowledge as intellectual property and use his patent rights to prevent the development of tests to determine if a fetus is gay. The life of a patent is only 17 years. At best, in about two decades, it will be legally and scientifically possible, unless we make a change, to test for gayness and abort fetuses who carry the gay gene, or again, 
intervene in vitro and eliminate the gay gene. This is not to suggest that all aspects of one's unique genetic heritage are to be off limits for gene therapy, far from it. This is a promising direction for many inherited diseases. Retardation, sickle cell anemia, Tay-Sachs, cancer, and many, many others. It is routine if one has these types of devastating inherited diseases today to do genetic family planning. Clearly, gene therapy in these and other cases is much to be desired. The elimination of unnecessary human suffering is a way to value the uniqueness of human life. In the spring of 2003, my husband, Dr. James Richard Thistlethwaite, and I have received renewed funding from the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences. And we are proposing a course called Race, Gender, and the Genetic Sciences. We are going to cover findings derivative of the Human Genome Project and related scientific research in gene therapy, stem cells, and cloning. We're going to try to place these in conversation with Christian theology using the constructive lenses of both race and gender. In a more focused and explicit way than the 2001 class, we plan to look at the way human life in community is affected by scientific research. And in turn, how contextual theological understandings of human existence can both contribute to and critique scientific advances. The 19th century was the industrial age. The 20th is the digital age. It is becoming clear that the 21st century is the biological age. I mentioned to some at dinner that my oldest son, James the physicist, says that the next leap forward in computers will depend on information storage capacity. Some are researching the use of crystals for this, but others are researching the use of bacteria. Your computers could be made, at least in their information storage capacity, of bacteria. Feminist liberation theologies have much to contribute to the constructive work society must do to work with and engage this rapidly changing scientific research. These scientific findings, like the 19th century or the 20th century, have the capacity to relieve human suffering and also to cause human suffering on an enormous scale. The conversation with science must be continuous and engaged, or only certain voices will be heard, and they will only be a few voices, and voices from certain dominant social locations. In the beginning was the word. It came from the sea and proselytized the earth. The words flowed out from the ones born of the word and flowed back into the sea as toxins. Be careful with the words you speak. The word is also speaking you, and you will have to listen. Thank you very much. It's my understanding we have some time for questions. I think from the mic being there that the drill will be come up to the mic and um, I, I'm, see, I'm a much higher here than you so that my words probably are supposed to count more but we won't do that, all right? You go to the mic as well and we'll talk about this. Just raise your hand and move up. For the, my sake and your community, if you would say your name. I was Johnson, and I'm a recent graduate of the undergrad over here. And um, as feminists and how our lives are impacted by the genome project and you know, gene testing, um, we call it bio, you know, biopiracism, and um, we feel that it's you know, against our um, setting in the community. But um, a geneticist would probably call that natural selection. And I was wondering if you could comment on hmm. that. 
a lot of biologists thinking that um, the people with the best genes are just going to win. And maybe there's people that's why the patriarchy is the way it is. That's why we have a hierarchy in our social strata. Um, I, I'm not certain what geneticists you would be referring to. I at least have not read current genetics. I mean, sure, you've got eugenics and so forth. And again, you know, I, I don't think it's wrong to look at the ways in which science has contributed profoundly to uh, discrimination, and eugenics might be an example of that. I don't offhand know of anybody who's arguing that today. Uh, you might find conservative theologies arguing that our biological inheritance does or should determine, uh, and, and I would think it would not be wrong to say, uh, does even determine hierarchy. This would be the orders of creation, an interpretation of Genesis that there's a certain order in creation and that you must not uh, veer away from that. Certainly a, a tremendous foundation uh, for um, patriarchy. You know, that women are second in the order of creation and first in the order of sin. Um, and um, so I think that that would be less, in my view, from contemporary biology than it would be from amongst parts of our own community in Christian theology, if, if you find that helpful at all. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Other questions, comments? Yes, sir. And it's okay to form a little line up there because it tends to facilitate things, I think, in getting people to the questions. Hi. Uh, you had mentioned that genetically speaking, you're more alive than anything else. You mentioned that you're more alive than Yeah. Not to deal with issues of race. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Sure. Oh, oh, oh I th uh, yeah, absolutely. I have certainly heard people use the 99.9% .9 we're all alike uh, as a uh, therefore racism doesn't exist. Uh, or it's all in your imagination or something. Um, and I think that that's why I was emphasizing so strongly that in fact the social construction of sin is real and it, in, in my view, it is, it is plainly an aspect of sin. Uh, but I, I have heard this, I have seen people argue this. Uh, I don't know if anybody saw the press conference when uh, they um, announced the completion of the first read-through of the Human Genome Project, there was certainly um, uh, that undertone that now we have cured racism. Uh, and you know, in some sense, some sense it's actually also not wrong in that it's, we're clearer now that, that racism is a socially constructed phenomenon. Uh, and so that's helpful. But remember, I'm also saying that the Human Genome Diversity Project has stalled. And so how much diversity there is, I think, is, is not all that clear. And 99.9%, .9%, even that 1%, that's still, you know, in terms of the number of uh, um, uh, genes we're talking about, it's not insignificant. Um, so. Uh, I, I, it's, this is complicated. I, nothing goes away, it just comes back in another form. You know? Yes, ma'am. I was wondering if you would comment on uh, something that really discusses frequently, uh, it seems, in more than one chapter, describing what is uh, an XY antagonist. Yeah. And would you say a word or two about that? And what that well, I thought he went on at length about that in. 
made me wonder about his relationships. You know? <laughs> um, for those of you who not read the book, there's a lot in there about the XY antagonism and as sex as struggle and as uh, genes, uh, genetic uh, uh, material. Also, there's a, there's a, you know, the risk of a book like that is that they're going to get anthropomorphism. You know, you start thinking about genes as having agendas and, and so forth. And, and I thought that was a little over the top. And I, I, I gave it to Dick to read, and he went, this is such bunk, you know. So, um, I, yeah, I thought that that was, was transparently one of the most anthropomorphized. Uh, so you'll write an article so that that can be debunked. Oh, yeah, right, certainly, yeah. Just say, my so-called spare time, you know. Uh, right. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, I'm not like, you know, I'm going to take up your thoughts about racing events. Um, I mean, that's why I spent a lot of my time thinking about it because actually there's a step beyond the human being of the rest of the project that I would actually like to discuss with you. Um, and that is that there is a fourth generation now currently in development called the Haplotype. The Haplotype now mm -hmm. has a number of different names, but the, the, the truth of the matter is that that for those who say that there is no such thing as race, it's obvious that they are foolish. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and it's also the case that there's a growing amount of evidence that there are differences in gene frequencies among different races, although there's a lot of commonality with all these differences. Um, and as part of that, um, we are engaged in a project under the head of the LCMR, so that's why I'm very aware of it to actually develop a new map that actually does um, try to understand diversity among all populations. And I can tell you that the Human Genome Diversity Project has, has made, has made the wires enormous um, because of the, the concerns about bio piracy and other things like that. And so the result is that we actually have a strategy that we are pursuing of actually sampling Population from 12 different parts of the world to try, first of all, to see if in fact there is a common genetic structure. Right. Um, among, and how common it is among all these various groups. And then if it, it turns out that there is a relatively common structure, then actually to develop a full genome map done this way from different parts of the world. Um, I will also tell you about where the samples may come that are done in the Nino project, since I was involved in that too. Um, that, in fact, one of the concerns early on is that they're all male graduate students um, <laughs> in the genome lab because you have the DNA from sperm. And, in fact, one of the things that did happen was that we went back and created new sets of samples. Um, from that actually included women as well as men, um, and that were not derived from the lab. So frankly, one of the issues that we're very involved with is, first of all, how to think about race in terms of the sampling strategy, how to think of this in terms of the descriptive strategy, recognizing, um, I actually tend to use the word wickedness to describe the way people tend to use, um, tend, to, uh, tend to think about race in society. Um, and to try to think about developing this robust map that could be used for discovery, but recognizing that there will be people like white supremacists out there who will use it in ways that I frankly refer to yeah. So, I mean, yeah, no, and I, I don't think we're saying anything all that different because. Uh, what I'm bringing to the table is that one of the, one of the strategies that we're trying to do as we move forward with this project is that we want to come up with a strategy to do this that is utterly transparent. I mean, utterly transparent to the populations whom we're, whom we're inviting to participate, and utterly transparent to the population, you know, to the larger population. We want to be in a position that when this project is done, you can look at us and say, they did it pretty, they did a really good job. And I also know from talking with you at dinner that in pursuing that, you are in dialogue with theologians and ethicists. Yes, and, and I, I think that's an example of the future I am imagining uh, more and more, where there is more and more dialogue between theologians and ethicists that produce mutually, mutually uh, uh, beneficial outcomes. 
Um, I, I don't think, as I said, I don't think the critique is all on the theological side. No, well, I, well, I just wanted to bring that up because there is a step beyond the HGDP. Um, there's a step beyond the Great. Thank you. I find that it's spiritually uplifting myself, yeah. I find it very disturbing that only 40 pairs of brothers were tested for the game. That's just the initial study. I mean, I could have gone on with that at some length, but, but that, that's the initial insight that led to this. And uh, there are a whole bunch of, atten you know, the, the family heritage and so forth raise all kind of ethical issues and people with self-identified people. So, I mean, it's, it, it, the research on that has improved. I just wanted to get into it with that research by no means any longer the, the limit uh, of the population sampled for that, for this trajectory in research. Yeah. And uh, I imagine that the research is going to continue while it is under patent. Uh, yes, as far as I know. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. My name is Jean. Hi, Jean. I, I want to raise the issue of the dialogue between the theologians and the scientists or the whoever's that are, are doing things. I am lately have been talking with friends who have been enormously concerned about the ability of uh, the theological community to be represented in the discussions subsequent to 9-11. And so my question for you is, um, in the areas that you've been covering tonight, what do you see as the potential for theological, ethical concerns being heard and being attended to. Is it at the invitation of the scientists that you may come to the table? Do you have your own credentials which get you there anyway? And to what extent does this filter down to the general public? Because all of this is very nice in academy, but I'm not so sure that the man in the street is going to hear much of the message. Um, could you just, before you leave the microphone, tell me more about what you mean about post 9-11? What did you mean by that? Well, there was a lot of concern among uh, friends of mine that um, many people were being interviewed and you weren't hearing at a time when it seemed crucial from the theological community about how you should view others in different religions, how our national policy um, was considering the human condition, human rights, uh, the ethics of what we were doing, um, issues of that sort, okay. and, and there were no um, theological written probably only in September and October two dozen letters to the editor and not having had one of them published. Um, I, I believe we are in a national period of extreme censorship where um, dissenting views just simply do not make it into the public press. Uh, I think the press should be ashamed of themselves these days. They are lackeys. Um, as per the scientific theological dialogue, um, like all other human conversation, it is various, it is located, it's sometimes the result of certain projects and invitations that are issued in a more formal way. This is a foundation um, that specializes, the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences, specializes in funding science-religion dialogues. Um, and I think it's a good thing that they do. Um, so this was Laurel and I cooking this up in my office and applying. Um, so I think you've all, so we've also got these 
scattered conversations going on. Um, I think that's a good thing. I don't see that as a negative thing. Uh, two further things about getting this to, to the average person, to the lay person. That's the reason we made the project for the students into writing a, a web course for, uh, we, we ran this through a computer program that measures reading level. And we tried to get it to an eighth grade reading level, uh, figuring that that was a good litmus test for could we make these concepts accessible to the public. I think this is a great class assignment. The students and I and Laurel and Laney, we wrestled hard with how to take not only the scientific terms, but how to take the theological terms and render them in really ordinary English. And we tried very much to, to work on that. And as I said, this is a free web course that anybody who logs on to our website can take. Uh, as part of the 2003 course, we are actually funded for a public conference. And my husband and I thought that was important to do. Um, we will, you know, probably do something electronic out of that as well. But I think it's very important to try to facilitate as best uh, we can in different locations um, people getting their arms around these issues um, in, in more than the grossest uh, uh, ways. Others? Okay, then I will see you at the reception.